thanks so much for coming. My name is Kelly McHenry and I'm a librarian. And uh, Conversations on Social Issues is a, is a weekly event. It happens every Thursday at noon. We love it when students get involved, um, staff members, faculty, administrators, anybody working at the college, as well as community members. And um, we are currently planning our schedule for next quarter, which will be fall. So if you're interested in doing a session, contact me or Kimberly Tate right here at this door. So this series um, is really an extension of the library's charge to promote freedom of information and exchange of ideas. And so um, I hope you'll come to more of them in the future. Next week we have one with Mahin Lakani and Luf Sharma. They are going to be talking about um, traffic jams, um, stuck in traffic, traffic, city growth, and inequality in uh, Seattle. So that's going to be very um, relevant for our lives here. Hope you can make it. And today, Taipathy, I just, I know that's wrong. I know how to say that. Taipathy is going to introduce our speaker. Ty is, um, is a, a staff person here in student leadership coordinator. And he's also president of the Washington State Federation of, um, Washington Federation of State Employees, Local 304. Thank you. Please welcome to Thank you, Kelly. So, it's my honor to introduce Nick Licata, um, one of our former city councilmen. Uh, Nick Licata is an activist, writer, author, poet, and again, former city councilman. He served four and a half um, sessions as a former city councilman from 1998 to 2016. Uh, among Nick Licata's big accomplishments was he sponsored the South Sick Leave Bill that we currently have, protected renters' rights, made sure that our social services were funded, as well as making sure that our money was spent on part of the benefit of the community instead of business deals or stadium deals. Uh, Nick has been an activist for years and started out in Seattle in the 70s and 80s, uh, trying to build the progressive movement in Seattle, and he stood out as one of the most progressive councilman during his tenure. Uh, he is also the author of a book, uh, Princess uh, Bianca and the Vandals, as well as the book he just recently released, and uh, we have copies of it over here, called Becoming a Citizen Activist, Stories, Strategies, and Advice for the Changing World. Um, I read through the book entirely, and I think it was a lovely book. It took great narratives, stories, and bits of his history and wove it into a book showing how people can become involved in their communities and really make change in the world around them. So at this point, we all please give a warm welcome to Nick Lepon. Uh, thank you, Ty, and um, I appreciate you having the opportunity to talk to all of you. Uh, it's a great introduction. Talk to the guys from the past. Obviously, you ask questions, and then I'll uh, talk about it. Um, I, I wrote the book because I found myself being active in a lot of different sort of civic issues and I asked myself why I, I became that way. And I think part of it was uh, my parents, uh, you know, I grew up in a very sort of working class family and neither of them had gone to, uh, had actually graduated from high school. Uh, one was forced to move out. I dropped out of school in the eighth grade, so he never went beyond that and he had to support his family. And my mom was an orphan, so her guardians forced her to quit uh, high school uh, the, to support them. But they're both very smart people. One of the things I learned is that formal education is important and it's critical, but uh, just because you don't get education doesn't mean that you can't think, you can't be logical, you can try to influence your, your future. But what I also realized was that um, they were, their future was largely shaped by people around them, uh, and that they felt that they had no control over their I, I think that's true, quite honestly, with a lot of people uh, who find themselves in, um, in today in the, in the U.S., particularly with the huge gap in wealth and income. People feel like they have very little control over their, over their existence. Um, I am going to read, actually, one small section of the book. I'd be a reader for those who are familiar with it. It's uh, reprinted, it, and it, it, it talks about uh, I had attended a, a rally of George Wallace. Does anybody know George Wallace? 
This is someone who ran for president uh, back in, I want to say, 68, I think was the date. And um, he was a well-known segregationist. And uh, a lot of his messages, uh, I won't say who, but if you listen to him, you might be reminded of some credit in the office. Um, but the, the book basically major theme is that we live in a democracy and that in order for it to function, you have to be an active citizen. So my message isn't that everybody has to go out and be an activist because I think that's unrealistic. I think most people have busy lives. And also, um, an activist almost connotates that you're on a cause, sometimes 24-7. I was in Indianapolis talking to some city council members who are, are very, I would say, you know, using the term progressive, but they wanted to be responsive to the community. And, um, and I mentioned being a citizen activist. And one of the council members said, well, I, I, I don't like following causes. And I said, well, that's, that's not the point you know, we're trying to make here. We're trying to basically point out that in a democracy, it only works when we have citizens who are active. If they're passive, then what happens in government, it literally shrinks because you have fewer people participating in it. And the people who are left participating in it are the people who have more time, have more money, have more resources, and they're going to direct what that government does. And as a result, you end up with what I call more of a phony government, a government that really may be called a democracy that doesn't really represent the interest of people, often because people in office either, as, as one would say, are, are bought by power interests, or don't have interests aligned with the people they represent because they come from a different sort of, different sort of class, different background. Uh, or they don't have the resources. Now, I use the example of Indianapolis because I was there speaking at Butler University for a few classes. And I give an example of what happens when people who argue about shrinking government uh, because you know they define freedom and liberty. This is a very sort of libertarian right wing approach as the absence of government or of shrinking government because they don't see government as being democratic um, or having the potential for being exercising democratic power to spread resources fairly amongst all the people. So they argue for shrinking government. In Seattle, we we we're talking about municipal government here. Um, we have city council members who are full time. I have full-time staff. I think council members line them have three full-time staff. There's a central staff of 20. And we have multiple commissions, uh, citizen commissions. We have commission on disability, we have a women's commission, the rights commission, one of the refugees. Um, and so there's at least a couple dozen. In Indianapolis, population is 50% bigger. Ours is 660, there's like 880. And our territory is 88 square miles. They have like over 300. So it's a much bigger city. They have 25 council members. Well, that seems a little, a lot, a lot, but that's okay. So I asked them, so how much do you earn? And it's interesting. You have to ask them, we're raising the minimum wage at $15 an hour, which would basically mean you get $30,000 a year, right? When you go out to get a job, your first job may be in the minimum wage, but you don't intend, you don't actively go out and try to find a job. In Indianapolis, they get paid fifteen thousand dollars a year. They have to ask yourself, who's going to get that kind of job? Well, someone who's either retired and already has secure income somewhere, someone whose uh, partner can support them, or they work for a business either they own they can take off the time, or a business that basically will subsidize them. But how many people fit into that kind of category? Not very right many. So then I said, well, okay, you don't earn very much money. How many staff do you have? To help you. And I said, well, each of us have no staff. I said, well, you have central staff. Well, yeah, we have central, we have six, or maybe it's seven central staff for 25 pounds a month. And then and I'm thinking, so you have an office? Well, we have a drawer and a filing cabinet. Now that is what the Indianapolis city government looks like. What would you expect from that sort of government? Very, very little. Right? They're not going to really do much. They're a, a name for So, the, fitting into the theme of the book is, okay, so if you're a citizen and you're in a democracy and you should be 
active, not active, but active in, in influencing it, one of the things you have to do, what are the steps you go through? And this is good to know when you're trying to motivate other people to join you in something, or in becoming more conscious about your own environment. And the very first step is being conscious. Being conscious of what your living or working conditions are. And I begin the book actually with an example of people who, two people in particular, who I think in some ways were the leaders in getting us the $15 minimum wage passes, you know. And no one knows their names. They're not elected to office. They're not union leaders. They're not uh, executive directors of nonprofits. They're not even employed by any of those organizations. One was employed by McDonald's, and one was employed by Burger, Burger King. One was a woman, Martina, who had been working at McDonald's for a year and a half, and she noticed that her paycheck showed that her dollars that she, she was earning was not equal to the dollars she was working. In other words, she wasn't being paid when she came in early and prepared the, the place to get started, and she wasn't paid for cleaning up afterwards. And after a year, she realized that and said, hey, um, and she trusted me. She just assumed that the hours were there on the table. So she didn't like question. She didn't go in there looking for something. It just dawned her after a while. She said, these hours are not going to pay. So she talked to her manager. And the manager said, well, that's where we do things, and then discussion. And then the other person was Jason. And Jason worked at Burger King for five years and had um, never received a raise. And it was so shocking that I mean, he didn't realize that I do a, a raise after eight years. And she get a raise. He's 40 years old. And his manager basically said, well, you do get a raise. You get minimum wage. And we have a consumer price index, and you'll get your one or two percent, whatever it is, for that year, uh, which you can't raise five on. He was already being paid at that time, uh, minimum wage, ten dollars an hour. So they were both um, knew that there was stuff going on, protests on a national level. They were approached by a group called Griffin Washington that said basically, you know, there's going to be a walkout one day across the country. People who work in fast food is just a walkout. Say we have bad working conditions. Uh, we give you one to do that. And Martina had a little struggle with it, as one can imagine. It's her only job. And her biggest disappointment, her realization, this is the, the, sort of the consciousness, is that her boss was not her family. I mean, think about it. You know, your family protects you. You go to work for someone. They say you're going to love this job. They take care of you. And she realized she wasn't really. Leaving. Back if you're taking advantage of him. Now, with Jason, he had worked this place for eight years and he was scared to death of losing his job because he didn't know where he'd get another job. Um, but he finally said in my interview, he goes, You know, fear doesn't tell you what to do, you tell what fear to do. It was very interesting. Quote. So they both walked out for that one day. They both actually did not get fired and they, they actually took a more public role that he spoke before City Council. But if they hadn't done that, the politicians wouldn't have done anything. The organizing groups would have been a failure. It was people basically willing to put their job on the line, which is really a big deal. You think about how many people would challenge their own job, you know, put it in jeopardy. And one of the things that was interesting that Jason said, and this is why I am going to talk about, it's important to recognize that victories need to be celebrated, even when they're not perfect as they serve as examples of success. He had learned, or he had seen, that the paid sick leave had passed the previous year and a half before. And he had never been paid while he was sick at home. Uh, they would prefer having him come in and serve hamburgers while he was sneezing on it, uh, because they didn't want to spend any money. And he said, when I realized that we actually want something, that citizens actually want something, that's what gave them courage to go out and actually take that day off. So consciousness is the first thing. It's being aware that you have a, a situation that's intolerable and it can be changed. And it, it, there's all kinds of examples by using what like environmental hazards that go on that you might change, not just working conditions. Um, but the second step is you have to go beyond complaining. They could have complained, and then we can complain about what we have. And complaining is somewhat therapeutic. You know, you can feel get something off your chest. But complaining is not a solution, and it's not a path for the solution. 
you have to know what you want. I used to have people when, they were, when I was in the office, you come to my office and complain, it's great, but you have to tell me what you want. What is it you want? Most people, when you think about it, they're not really thinking what they want. In this case, they want a raise increase. Um, one of the examples I use is, uh, some of you may know, Senator uh, Camilla Fajar, who's now running for Congress. She had become a citizen a year before 9-11 and, and she, she's from India, and she knew many people in the Indian community, both Hindus and Muslims, and they were all being discriminated against because they were all seen as potential terrorists. terrorists. And uh, she realized people were just literally grasped. So she said, I've got to do something. I should talk to a politician. She had never talked to a politician before. And she figured, well, I'll, I'll talk to my congressman, who's Jimmy Durkin called up his office and actually get a meeting with him. Just her. And she decided, well, I'll write a single sheet of paper, what the problem is, discrimination, what the solution is, what she wants him to do, which basically was hold a press conference. Just say that people have to change their behavior, that these are citizens, these are people we have to treat, this is our democracy, this is our values. So she went to the office, he had the sheet, she made her ask, he said, sure, I'll do that. It's small enough ask I can do it. And when he had the press conference, he showed up in the background. People showed up. And when he was through, some people asked him, so what are you, you going to do? What do you want us to do? And he wasn't quite sure. And he looked at the sheet of paper that she had given him. And she had typed across the top, hate free zone Seattle. Just the title she came up with. And he had his paper in his hand and said, you know, you got to join Hate Free Zones. Yeah, they're doing something about it. And that was in the press conference for the discussion. So she came up to him and said, "You know, that's just a title of the sheet. There's no such organization." And he looked at her and said, "You better start one," <laughs> which she did, and it eventually became One America, which is now one of the actually most visible groups not only in Seattle, Washington State, but around the country, bringing people together. The third element is, okay, you, you become conscious, you have a, you know what the solution is, or at least what the next step you want to take is. And the third thing is, you've got to get a minute. In the case of the journal, it's pretty clear. He said, yes, I'll do it. Sometimes the problems are bigger. And so it's not immediate. But in the world that I worked in, the political world, it's a question of getting legislation passed, either amending the law, getting a new law passed, or overturning a bad law or getting a program funded, an ESMIN program, or getting money in the budget for something. It's something very specific. And, we, and this is something to keep in mind, if you ever have something that you want to get something done within the government sphere, and you talk to someone in office and can be even a staff person, but ideally you want to eventually get to an elected who can actually make a decision. Um, you want to say basically, not just do you support it, because a lot of people will support it, Politicians have very easy to support. You want to say, will you sponsor this action? You sponsor the, the budget change. You sponsor the ad. You sponsor the amendment. You sponsor this language. And that's the biggest ask. And it's the most important because if they sponsor it, they're your ally. They're going to tell you, as they work the legislative process, what changes are made, who's thinking what. He's, he or she is invested. If they won't sponsor it, ask them to be a co-sponsor. Sounds like a middle, you know, sort of detail, but it's been important because if you're a co-sponsor, the next person you go to, we have a co-sponsor, you need a main sponsor. And that person would be more likely to do it. So that wouldn't be either of those two. The next question is, will you vote for it? And they may say, well, it depends what it is, but can we, as it's presented, we vote for it? If they say yes, get it in writing, or via email, get something in that's solid. In other words, you're always wanting to, in the, Sales world that says close the deal, get someone to basically say you're committed at some level. You have to, that's a building block. And in trying to reach an elected too, if you basically, this is not unusual, they don't have enough time to say, well, you can talk to my assistant, let's say, assistant, go for it, get that, make sure that person gets their name, get their contact, and be in touch with them because almost every elected will work with their assistants and will be with their assistants. Summers. That's why I use Indianapolis as an example. There, these people are working part time, they have no time to be uh, constituents, and they have no staff to help them. 
The fourth area is that you can't do it alone. You need allies. And there's different kinds of allies. The simplest, let's say it's a community issue, neighborhood issue, is your neighbor. Well, when I was speaking somewhere, a woman said, you know, I wrote a letter about this neighborhood problem to all the council members and I got back a form letter, which is somewhat different. Uh, but most of the time I didn't get anything. And then I wrote a second time and I got the same response. So I asked her, I said, so was there anybody else in agreement with you on this issue? Because, you know, people have been hit all the time. You have to show you've got some mass, some you know, other people interested besides yourself. If it's a legitimate issue, and sometimes you'll have to respond to that, but your chances increase if they know there's more people interested. And um, she said, no. And I said, so that's the first thing you have to do. Even if you have four or five neighbors, get them to sign a, uh, a letter or an email. Ideally, if there's a community group, and then again, I'm using a geographic example, see if that community group will support you. And then you have to understand, every organization out there in the US is to talk to noted close to 200 years ago, we love organizations. We all belong to organizations. Organizations have a rhythm. They have a structure. They generally have an executive group. They generally meet on a regular basis. And they generally don't make decisions until they get their executive to approve it and the organization to uh, sign off. That can be a very long process. It can stretch out a minimum of month, possibly as long as two or three months. If you have a tight timeline, Go to the person who's either the president or on the board and find out if that person is an individual to support you, and then use the title of their name for identification purposes only to sign off on something. So you found someone with some status and have a door opener also, an ally in that group to eventually endorse you or support you. Find someone who once was in office, who the politicians might know, to come out and support you. There's plenty of people who are in an office, they might, you know. You want to do it. So in other words, your allies can be people who have some status, who can go up for organizations and find organizations. And you work on paid sick leave, some of the strongest allies were unions because they have paid staff. And they're the ones after we started pushing for paid sick leave because their members wanted, obviously, the ability to stay home, take care of their children, and the children were sick or stay home and they were sick themselves. So they devoted full time staff to lobby, but more importantly, to research and counter, but react to the arguments that were made on the other side. And that dovetails into the next step, which is basically use data and facts. And now, when you have allies, one of the things you want to do, particularly those that are from institutions, and I should say that when we talk about allies, they can be regional or national. If there's any issue at all that you're interested in, and it, it goes beyond your immediate zone and your family, and your, and your, and your uh, family lot of your neighborhood, chances are there's some organization out there already working on it. Google it. Find out what organizations are out there and how they can help. Students at University of Washington were very interested in stopping, basically, child slave labor overseas. And they knew a number of corporations were engaged in it. And they were curious about what was going on in their campus, so there's any link. And they went and they did some Googling. They found out there was a, one or two national organizations that you don't know the names but you're in the book. And um, they said, yeah, you know, colleges a lot of times will contract with a group called um, Sodexo. And um, they basically use, you know, uh, sweatshops in Asia to uh, create often sweatshirts, uniforms, and you know you checked into it. Turns out that uh, they were making the the, um, it's a, the husky sweatshirts on contract with the University of Washington. They, they held a contract. So they went through. They did protests. They, they, they went to the president. They knew what they wanted to ask. Stop the contract. They had the data, the national group, of what was what was going on. They had uh, human rights groups be able to do studies. They presented a whole argument that was really, really difficult. Initially, they were just blown off by the administration because you know, it's just a group of students. But as they got momentum, and they went for allies. They actually went to the city council members on my south who wrote a letter saying, this is a bad policy. We, we want you to change your policy. We want you to get out of this contract. So they started spreading a network of allies. They had data. And University of Washington, at some point, couldn't ignore them anymore. 
But you know, there's always a question of pride. People don't want to be forced to do something, and they didn't want to just break the contract. But it turned out the contract was coming up that year. So when they did, they very quietly just did a new contract with that, group, that company. They went somewhere else. They saved face. It was a victory, and you had to celebrate that victory. You know, they didn't get the UW, they didn't get to say we forced the UW to you know, um, cancel their contract, but they did, in fact, get them to end their contract. So, uh, basically, data is very important. Um, get it awesome for people who are uh, allies. But also, when you get into a debate, when you're opposed to someone, there's different kinds of data. Surveys are often interpreted as data. I was involved in an effort to, when I first got on the city council, I was going to stop. Uh, well, initially I was supportive, like everybody else was, of having the Olympic Games here uh, for 2012. And, I mean, seriously, who opposes the Olympic Games? They all want to watch on TV. And it was a great honor to have your city, you know, invite them to come to be in your city. And so we started to, uh, you know, one of the things I've always done is, great idea, love it, let's do it. But wait a second, we should take a look at what the contract says. We should look, what's the cost? And then we found out that, at, and then we did some research, and there were some other groups out there. Uh, just about every city that the Olympic game plays in ends up losing money, because it's a huge public investment, and whatever money is made on generally for some private corporations, but the public pays the cost, both directly, paying the, the public treasury, as well as displacement of people, not to mention traffic congestion in Seattle, there would have been more um, tour boats coming in and basically dumping waste, uh, waste, uh, wastewater into our Puget Sound. So, gathered all this data together, and it was almost a miracle that we were able to defeat it because initially the mayor was on board, all the top businesses were on board. They had uh, international support from the Olympics uh, International Committee. Seattle was the favorite of uh, all the cities in the U.S. applying for it. Uh, the woman who was heading the effort here was well liked. So it seemed like a done deal. But we kept chipping away at it. And one of the things that we did was they did a survey. They, being the proponents, showed 70% 70 of the people in Washington State love the Olympics, they love the habit. Well, you know, like I said, everybody was in favor of that. So we did a survey asking, if you knew that we had the Olympics, and the way the contract's written, if they lost any money, the citizens would have to pick it up, the public treasury would have to pick it up. And you know, when people saw that, it was like, we're not so interested anymore. They had less than 50%. And they knew that if a campaign came out like that, they would not be able to win the support. So in the end, what happened was, um, there was a resolution to support the Olympics. And the pressure became so hard on the city council, they never borrowed out their vote. And then we, we pushed forward with a, a and then after the Olympics, then they went to maybe the public, try to find someone other than the city council to support it. There's a group called Pacific, uh, we call it the PSRC, Puget Sound Regional Council, which is a planning organization. It's not elected, but it's, you know, it has electeds on it. They've got, we do an end run around city council, and this is how corporations work. And, uh, and then we threatened to write a letter saying that we don't like it. And then they just dropped it. Uh, I didn't know what the end was. Um, but it was well worth it. So allies, having data, and then getting the word out. And getting the word out is it's critical. You can do a lot of different things. Forums are important. When I mentioned Bob Cornell, when she did a working on getting the language change in Seattle regarding having our police not enforce uh, federal laws, doing basically stops and saying if people are citizens or not. Um, they had a forum, not in City Hall. They could, but having City Hall is good because it's no longer get politicians there. They had something in town hall. They invited politicians there which showed up. They had a thousand people show up. And it just consists of testimony. A forum will bring outside media attention. It will bring reporters in. Uh, I did a forum once at everybody's familiar with Two Bells Tavern downtown, then we great, great OR, great hamburgers. We did a, we did a, a, a forum there. At that time, it was a watering hole for a lot of the reporters. And we had a big crowd, 
small towns, it's easy to be proud. But more importantly, there are a lot of reporters there. They can quaff a beer and hear about, you know, in this case, the Olympics. So anyhow, forms are important. There's strategy for getting the word out. Do your own survey, that's another way of getting the word out. Um, obviously, everyone says use social media. It's not just a question of using social media, it's how you use it. And don't forget the old fashioned or the traditional media, everything from newspapers, posters. They're very critical. In fact, probably the most powerful poster that came out in the last 10 years in Seattle was very, very simple. In fact, if you think about it, it only had one word on the poster. It did have, if you count it, four, well, three symbols. It had a dollar sign, a number 15, and the word now. As simple as that. Everyone saw it and knew immediately what it was. But posters also have limited visibility. So, you put it on Facebook, and you tweet about it. And then they retweet, and then as a result, you end up in a massive amount of getting the word out combined with old technology. Hi, do you need to see someone? I am so, so That's okay. sorry to interrupt. Um, so Pat needs to go home sick. Okay. No, that, don't, don't worry. I'm sorry. That's, I hope it's okay. Thank you. So in any case, the, the, the uh, efforts there are forms, getting the word out, um, using different kinds of tools, and there are many tools out there uh, that you can use to, to amplify. The, um, and I should say, included in getting the word out is cultural activities. We have to think about that. In fact, when you think about the uh, gay rights movement in looking at Seattle. In 71, at that time, as Mayor Russ Allman, he declared gay pride week, which was a big deal. He actually had people outside City Hall with signs going to impeach him. If you got impeached, you called. And, uh, and it took a couple years after they actually had a, uh, a gay pride parade. Uh, when the first in the country was held here in San Francisco, we decided. Um, and it was small, but it started growing. But the thing is about it, it was, Celebrating, it was encouraged people to come out to the open, and it was open ended. Anyone could watch the parade, anyone could join it, long as obviously they were disruptive. And growing from a very small event that probably had, the very first time, maybe two, three hundred people on Capitol Hill. Now 200,000 people show up. You know. um, and of course, the movement continued to go on as a, you know, as a group. One of the little Point people to forget about is that one of the things I point out is that uh, in an article I wrote somewhere else, I didn't quote that book, um, when you make more room for other people, you have to make more room for yourself. It's not a subtraction, it's an addition. An example is that the Women's Commission in Seattle preceded the Gay Commission by many years, but the Women's Commission was one of the strongest proponents of gay rights in Seattle. Because as the Women's Commission was started, a number of the lesbians were major um, women leaders. And they also recognized that not only women, but also with gays, they were being discriminated against. So by giving women more power, they in fact created more power and more freedom for another group that did not have representation. Uh, so the final sort of step the final in the process, in some ways, is at the core of all the others, and that's attitude. And there's three elements to that. One is that you have to have an open attitude. Basically, means you have to you have to listen before you talk. In other words, you really don't convince people by browbeating them. Uh, I mean, who likes to be browbeated uh, unless you're an acidist? Yeah. And so, uh, you'd much rather talk to someone who understands you, who listens to what you have to say, and then you're more likely to respond. So you have to be open. You also have to believe that by being open and by working on things, you actually can make change. In other words, you have to believe in the democracy that we live in. You know, one of my major concerns is that 
too often, so much literature that we read, which is good literature, I read it all the time, put out by what I call a progressive community, people who are basically concerned about where our country is going, that there's so much emphasis on what's wrong, I think sometimes it creates the opposite effect. And people get angry, and then they become overwhelmed, and then they feel like they can't do anything. And every time you drop out, you create a gap, and someone else steps into it, and it's not going to be in your interest. So it's good to know what's wrong, but you also have to know what you can do to make it right, and you have to celebrate the things that you succeeded in doing. You have to have a sense that progress has been made, and you have to sustain that belief. And the last, which is in some ways is somewhat the easiest to, to understand, um, it's in our, our book, right? It's pursue the happiness. You know, unless you have a good attitude that you know, you're down the road that you want to make an environment that benefits everyone, if you're going to be, if you're going to approach change as drudgery, if you're going to approach it as sort of a obligation that's a burden, you're not going to have a whole lot of people following you. You're not going to really inspire people. People like to have fun. That's why culture and parades are important. But that's also why, you know, people want to work towards something that they're going to enjoy life. Um, I want to open the questions and answers, but also I just realized I had not written that section. So it's up to you. Do a Q&A or can read a short part on uh, George Wallace? What would you think about? Pardon? Do I go on? Let me grab this here. It's uh, under this. Uh, uh, well, the little lesson in the first area is uh, politics and anger. I have found that if you go out of your way to listen to those you most strongly disagree with, you will gain insights of how they are successful reaching people you want to reach. In learning what they say and how they say it, you can learn how to reach the same people with your message. In, 19, in the 1968 presidential election, civil rights were a significant issue. However, where the left wing was fractured, running multiple candidates, the far right was coalescing around one man, former Alabama Governor George Wallace. Although he had been a Democrat, he was running as an independent and as the nation's foremost advocate for racial segregation. He had personally barred the path of two black students attempting to register at the University of Alabama in 1963. But he was also a populist, supporting increased social security and Medicare benefits. Not fitting necessarily a stereotype that one would expect. Well, also attacking hippies for not working and for liberals for being soft on crime. In the spring of my junior year, I heard that Wallace was going to give a campaign speech in Toledo, Ohio, during Bowling Green, just south of Toledo, Ohio. And that was less than a half hour drive from Bowling Green. We talked to a few friends into joining me at the rally. I did not go to protest. I knew that would be futile, given the audience's orientation. And instead, I wanted to understand what Wallace's attraction was, and to see how it interacted with the audience. Not only would I better understand his arguments, but I would also see how he delivered his message. So we walked into this packed Toledo High School gym. The bleachers were filled with working class people. We found ourselves sitting high on the bleachers, above the podium, with a perfect bird's eye view of the audience. And these were familiar folks to me, the kind I had grown up with. Not a suit or tie among the men, who also sported trim haircuts, neat casual clothing. The women were dressed modestly, no short skirts, no jeans. This was obviously not a college age crowd. <laughs> I thought their ordinary attire, however, belied a simmering rage within them. The crowd stamped their feet like a marching band in anticipation of Wallace's arrival. It grew louder with time, this thumping noise throughout the entire room. They had more passion than they had witnessed at any anti war rally. When Wallace finally appeared, everyone rose and clapped in a mighty roar, as if he were a maestro in front of an orchestra. He stepped up to the podium and proceeded to whip them into an ever higher pitch of anger at everything that was wrong with this country, from pampered college students rioting the streets, the black welfare gags refusing to work, 
women nodded and shouted in agreement when Wallace said that rich liberal elites controlled both the Democrat and the Republican parties. He repeated his famous line, it's not a dime's worth of difference between the Democrat and Republican parties. I'd heard that same sentiment at home and somewhat ironically at anti-war rallies. He had talks about why they shared the reasons. Citizens had no control over their own government. Looking down, I announced a dozen black students stood on the main floor, right below Wallace's podium, vociferously objected to his racist remarks. Wallace smiled and pointed to them, as if they were many rated props to focus the white crowd's aim. United against a common enemy, the audience catapulted insults down. I feared for their safety, but they were physically harmed. Wallace needed them as a foil, not as victims. Although neither a handsome Kennedy nor Harry Lyman McCarthy were also one at that time, Wallace cut a swath of the Democrats' core blue collar workers. That evening, I felt the heat of the resentment toward those who didn't work, who didn't have to work as hard as they did to make a living. Wallace would jab his finger at the audience as a poking pointing out the black people, college students, and liberals who were seeing benefits that they would never receive. He was a master at reading the crowd and reflecting their anger. His ability reminded me, reminded me of something Leon Trotsky had with an unexcelled ability to detect the mood of the masses was Lenin's greatest power. Apparently, it is an ability uncovered by ideology. Even though laws did not win, his message had resonated with working families, the very ones the left was trying to attract. Driving back to Bowling Green, I thought of the Reverend Martin Luther King's speech that I had heard in New York the previous year. King spoke with indignation rather than raw anger, and with hope rather than envy, appealing to reason and need of love. Walter the Democrat, who unleashed, unleashed tremendous energy for the dark side of the collective soul. There would be no compromise in there. Unfortunately, uh, either with victory or defeat. This was an ad that unfortunately began to grow in 68 with the left as well. Except in that case, it was either revolution now or failure. King away from the Wallace rally, seeing how appealing to the built up anger in people and blaming those who are weaker, like black students or those far off, like politicians in DC, could generate excitement and a sense of purpose but it did not build bridges between people, which I felt was the basis of a democracy that could sustain rational change to benefit all. Democracy is a great level, but it only works if people believe they have power as citizens. And I came away believing that being an activist is not about promoting absolute solutions, which stirs passions or destructive logic. It's about addressing people's anger by giving them some control over their lives. So that was my experience. You might think of some people these days who are making similar statements and getting people uh, round up. Anyhow, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> open to uh, comments, ideas, questions. I thought you were getting some food. Oh, yeah, I think Ernie was first. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just curious about the, uh, the genesis of the book, um, sort of the narrative behind the narrative. Um, did you have the book in mind in, um, for a while? Had you been writing it for a while? Or were you approached uh, yeah. as your tenure ended and then decided to do it? Or how? Were you taking notes this whole time? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, that's, that's a great question. I always ask writers that, too. They're always curious. Like, how did you do this? Well, the backstory is actually sort of interesting because this is actually the second book. The first book, I mean, I wrote a children's book on this topic. Um, I was very active in college. I, I helped start a rock and roll organization, SDS, and ended up doing all kinds of things in college. Um, and I had saved clippings. So I had a massive amount of clippings. I went through, I collected them, and I put them all together in narrative. And then I realized I had the beginnings of a story, so I wrote a book on the student power movement in the 60s. How it grew up, how it failed, where it succeeded. And uh, worked on it for four years. And then I went around publishers saying if they were interested. And the response pretty much was really interesting, well written, and well said. 
uh, basically because no one knows it. Uh, and I, one local publisher, Sasquatch, said the same thing and said, so do you have anything else? Which to me, it seems like an immediate insult. Like, how many books do you read at the same time? Right? Uh, but then I threw out, well, how about Handbook for Activists? He said, I love that. Show me something. And you could use you know, some of the stuff I had in the book, which, like that, for instance, that second was in the first book. Uh, so I had a timeline. He said, come up with something in nine months. And so I just worked on the book for four years, and I thought, I'll do it. And I did. And that's where this came from. And it's much more contemporary. And it also is based on sort of the how-to. Uh, based not just on my experience, but other people's experience and what I saw. So that's, that's how that happened. Yes? I just had a conversation, quite a spirited conversation with my class the other day, my social policy class, uh -huh. um, with students who are making the choice because their candidate doesn't the nomination, um, their choice not to vote. Yeah. Um, and I'm hearing this not just from them, but from many people. Um, sure. And I'll, I'll just say who they're talking about. If it's not Bernie Sanders, they're choosing not to vote. Sure. Um, what's your response to that? You know, that is one of the hardest questions to answer. On one hand, I'm glad to hear many Republicans saying they're not going to vote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, and I, I don't think I would go out of my way to argue that they should vote for, uh, for their candidate. Uh, but um, it's just interesting, though. You know what they, some of them are arguing is that they're going to continue to organize, and they're going to continue. And I do think it's critical that they vote for um, Hillary, assuming that Hillary is a candidate. And I, in fact, I think pursuing that argument, even though many of my friends believe what you're supposed to do. Because it's not just executive. I mean, one of the strongest points is that it's conceivable that the next president could appoint as many as three people to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, just ask any of them, do you want the United decision? If you don't, get prepared for more, unless they are democratic. Uh, that is without doubt worth the vote. Just that alone. And I totally get how Hillary, I mean, I've been actually put up in my article. She started off as, you know, a white liberal family, up in, you know, not upper class, but up in the middle. And uh, I'll tell you, I think she's pretty much sold her soul to Wall Street in many ways. I don't think it was conscious. I think it happened over time. I think there's a core belief that's still there that's progressive. She did push for a very strong, um, uh, not single pair, but very similar when she lived, uh, her husband's in power. So she still had those beliefs. Both, hopefully they can be rekindled. But she's not going to be as bad as any Republicans have. And it's critical that we maintain some good points. So that's that first the strongest argument. The second is that dropping out is basically means you're a loser. OK? And I don't want to be a loser. And I don't want to basically have a loser strategy. Because that basically means that someone else is going to win. Um, and that's not going to be good for us. Um, and this is the thing that Bernie should should do, I believe. I mean, Bernie's been around for a long time. He's not a new kid on the block. I mean, I, I actually knew about him 20 years ago in his environment as mayor of uh, in Birmingham. Um, he. I don't believe we'll tell his supporters that we're going. It's going to be hard, but I think that he has the ability to work with others, Dan Jones and someone else, and the outdoor organizing, to actually create a sustainable movement, whether it's within the Democratic Party or outside. There are groups like Working Families, I don't know if the Working Families Party in New York, uh, which actually had some people here to, like they might run Washington State's campaigns. So there, there are paths to continue to influence the, the national politics. But the only exists if you put some time and energy at working for them. I, and I've gone through this 40 years ago with people because the revolution didn't occur, they basically, you know, they dropped out. And that to me was like selling out. 
Yes. Um, just the thing that comes to mind for me with that conversation is like it's taken up so much time among the people I know when, I mean, no matter what happens between now and November, Washington State's going to vote for whoever the Democratic nominee is. So it seems kind of like a moot conversation unless you're like talking with family, friends, and other in swing states. Um, so I, I feel like the emphasis like really needs to be like moving away from that conversation and like towards like how we build community power, how we build, you know, rebuild union power. So, you know, it's well, interesting. I'm reading a biography on Simon Linsky's by uh, David Fink. And um, he makes an interesting point. All organizations, no matter what organization, eventually move towards ossification. Okay? It's, it's not that bad people are in charge of organizations, it's just that people become comfortable doing what they do all the time. And the organizations, I mean, Alinsky and a guy named Fred Ross, who most of have heard of, was one of the primary organizers in California. In fact, he was the one who, I don't know if they discovered, but he's the one who hired uh, Cesar Chavez to work for uh, what they're called OSCs. You, community you Pardon? Um, service or, service, community service organizations, CSO. And, Chavez was 25 years old. A lot of people thought he was too quiet, too mild, whatever. But anyhow, kind of, they formed probably two dozen of these community-based organizations. But even Olinsky realized over time, even they began to ossify. I mean, you have to, as soon as heaven see all the communities, same viewers again and again. You have to have new folks come forward. But the point that I want to make is that there's two things going on. One is that organizations end up being comfortable with people in it. But secondly, technology changes. And when technology changes, the problems change. And you've got to change your organization. You've got to change the solution. Taxi cab drivers are the biggest example. Uber comes along, and all of a sudden, taxi cabs, the model for organizing taxi cab city by city has been the same for 50 years. And within a period of three years, it's dramatically changed because all of a sudden, everybody who had a standard job no longer could have a standard job. They could be basically contract where they put out work by people who are, they want to say, is it, you know, Uber is a social media creation. In any case, because that change, you have to change your tactics, you have to change new, have, that's why government has to be responsive, has to be flexible, has to realize that there's always change. And that gets to the third point. How many people here have played any kind of game? Everybody can raise your hand, obviously, right? We all play games, it's part of our human nature. Right, whether it's sports, whether it's a power game, whatever. But why do we play games? We play games because we're enjoyable, right? They tease our mind, they occupy us. But we tend to sometimes think that games are um, not important, they're something minor. This is the jujitsu where I said we jump on things. You know, I was on the city council for 18 years and I loved it. Okay, and I probably would still be honest, but I want to do something else I love it. I'm going to be talking. But the reason I loved it, it was a game. I love politics as a game, the game of winning, the game of trying to get somebody to move forward. There's no greater joy than trying to convince the other eight people on the council that they should do the right thing. I generally did not win. In fact, more often than not, I was a one to eight vote. But I did win a number of times, enough to sustain myself. And I enjoyed going back in and playing it again. So, you know, part of this attitude is you're not going to change the world overnight. And you're not going to have a final victory because things change. But if you enjoy, I hate to say enjoy the struggle because that's a big uh, pejorative term. You have to enjoy the process because being alive is, to me, is, is part of that process. People drop out. They're no longer playing. They're basically, they become the part. They become the pawn in someone else's game. So you have to decide, are you going to play the game, or are you going to be a piece in someone else's game? Yes? So with all the attention on the presidential race, um, with the different community groups that are being active in Seattle, how do we 
get them to refocus on the local? How do we get them to look at you know the city council races, the King County races, the state senate races? You know, a lot of the decisions that people really care about in their communities are really decided by those local groups. Absolutely. And how do we get that motto of all politics is local back out again? Well, it's, it's happening right now. I mean, as you probably know, I started a group of local progress that's a national network of 400 plus progressive uh, leadership officials. But in Washington State, that effort's going on right now. In fact, tonight, we're going to have the homers to meet with about eight different elected officials who are self described progressives and talking about how to create a strong network. Later this month, the same thing's happening with the East Side and then the South uh, in County area. There's groups that come on today to talk about running folks for municipal government, county government, state government. Um, my biggest, dis not my biggest, but one of my biggest disappointments with Obama was that he did not follow through on uh, creating what he said was going to be an office for, of, uh, what's it called, urban affairs. Uh, he started, he joined someone, and within two years, it sort of fizzled out. His great strength, I think, he somewhat ignored. And he was a community organizer in the city. Um, I think that there's a real opportunity to rebuild that in the United cities. And there's a lot of people who, in fact, do that that is the path to sustain uh, progressive change. I, oh, oh. Go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to put in a plug before everybody disperses. So we have this initiative going on on campus. It's a, uh, um, um, what do you call it, the task force, basically, a committee of Broad, uh, broad based task force, faculty, students, um, staff, and so forth, um, uh, to um, promote election activities, whether it be getting people registered to vote on campus, out in the community, or putting on events to get people more interested in the uh, um, democratic process, whatever. We're, it's open. Uh, we haven't, you know, it hasn't been formed yet. Uh, anybody who would like to join our committee, um, please see me. Peggy's on the committee. You, have, you know, Kelly. If you don't can't remember who's who, you know, Kelly's right here in the library. Talk to her, and uh, we'll get your email address and put you on the committee. We're also meeting at two o'clock today in the conference room in the uh, eleven o three, which is the you know, multicultural office. Thank and, you. An, and another plug: my <laughs> my students are doing a service learning project June first, and they will be registering voters um, all day long. And um, along with registering voters, they will be doing a lot of education on why it's important to vote, the history of voting rights, um, what's currently happening in voting rights across the country. So um, spread the word if you're not registered, which probably most of you are. And um, I want to add to what you guys are saying, and that is that if, if you know people who are not eligible to vote, but they want to get involved in the process, they can still have a lot of effect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, and so, you know, Im if immigrants, anybody, if, if you're not a citizen and you want to be active, that's great. Mm -hmm. Also, as a plug on top of that, if you want to be <laughs> involved on campus, there's many ways that students can have a big impact over how our college operates. There's campus committees like the, you know, um, college council, which needs student opinions and focus to make their decisions on the strategic plan for college. There's open forums like the Vice President of Construction, which will be coming out in June, to select that next leader for that part of our college. And again, students are welcome to come to those open and public forums. We also have our student leadership office, which is currently going through the hiring process for next year's student board members. But we'll be getting our associate student council members um, later on this fall. And so keep that in mind. There's also different committees and work groups for students through the Student Leadership Office that you can be involved in and volunteer on to help you know, guide the college in making sure that your voice as a student is listened to. I want to say one point about registering. I, uh, this morning, we had another uh, meeting with a group, uh, Progressive Alliance, and got to hear Steve Phillips, who wrote the book, uh, Brown is the New Water. He pointed out that Obama won. Uh, Ohio in 2008 for 200,000 votes. However, he lost 200,000 votes in 2012 of white voters. But he still won Ohio because they registered 200,000 new people, many of which were people of color. And he would have lost Ohio, and you know, it might not have turned out as good as we thought. 
when he met that was the one of the So right screen and being getting up vote is critical. Yeah, yeah. We, we just found that out this morning. When Paulo was here a couple of weeks ago, he gave numerous examples where people have won or lost by 36 votes, 68 votes. Yeah. That happened in West Seattle, right? Oh, well, yeah. by, by yeah. this is a, this is her vote. Yeah. Won by 39 votes in West Seattle. And the chamber, who was never a big backer of mine, uh, they, uh, <laughs> they were scared to death that she was going to win because she was in LA, my LA for 18 years. And quite honestly, it was uh, the, the engine behind a lot of the stuff I was doing. Very sharp, did great research. She never wanted to be a public official. My staff isn't going to run. A lot of people asked her to quit myself, and she was very reluctant to finally decide to do it. Um, and the district elections, so she's one of West Seattle. West Seattle is not known as Capitol Hill. Okay? It's probably one of the more working class, maybe even conservative areas. So the chamber thought they could beat her. And, you know, we said this, but we did for the Dow and the rest of the opponent, and Joe McDermott did, and so she had what's called West Seattle establishment come out uh, supporting her opponent. So, the chamber threw in what's called independent expenditures because they can't directly donate to the candidates because we have really pretty good uh, spending caps here, contribution caps. Two hundred thousand dollars against her election. She spent roughly hundred and her opponents spent hundred. So they spent as much as both candidates spent together. Um, and she still won. That was a narrow victory, but they were in shock. They could not believe. So money doesn't always win. I mean, or most often it does. But she had a great ground uh, ground team. And that's a big thing you have to work with us. Thank you so much. Sure. For yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone does get it, I'll sign it. So. Wonderful. And it's at a discount today, right? Yes. Yes. Correct. yes. 20% off today. Great. And more comes to the store if you can't save today. There's more there. Okay, good.